Hello, everybody. I want to talk to you about how we build stuff. We build cities, is what humans do. We build cities and infrastructure and buildings and bridges and tunnels. And, you know, that, you know we've been doing this for thousands of years. And it's, it's great and everything, except for the fact that we build this stuff and it falls down. Um, and, and, and it's kind of the way we build stuff that is intrinsically the problem. And this picture shows what I mean, really, uh, if we go to the slide, that you can see that, you know, we build roads and they get potholes. Uh, we build buildings and they get cracks. We build bridges and they start to weather in the, in the, in the, in the, um, the storms. And as, as the 21st century goes forward, this is going to be a bigger and bigger problem because as bigger storms come, so they're going to hit our infrastructure, so it's going to get damaged, so we have to dig it all up again, make it again. And this costs a lot of energy and it costs a lot of resources. We end up having to mine stuff out of the ground and it's not sustainable. So there must be another way. There must be another way of living sustainably in cities with roofs over our heads, <laughs> roads, infrastructure. And that's what I want to talk to you about. It's, it's the concept of self-repairing cities. Okay, but before I can tell you about that, I need to just talk to you a bit about material science, what it is, because it's kind of key to this. So this, this picture in front of you um, is kind of difficult to comprehend at first, so I'm just going to talk you through it. In the middle is a scale diagram, and so the big stuff is at the top, and it gets smaller, 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 smaller. Now, on the left is living stuff. This is nature. This is how nature builds things. So you have big stuff like trees and whales, and then as you get smaller, you get mice, and then you get the fleas on the mice, and then you get the hot and the, the hairs on the flea. <laughs> and then if you zoom in even further, you'll find that everything is made of these multicellular components called tissues, your brain, your skin, your liver, your kidneys, but all of the, all of the stuff on earth is like this until you get down to single cells. And then you have bacteria and you have and all these things. And, and the thing is that you start out as a single cell. Everything starts out as a single cell. And it's kind of a Lego of, of the living world. But if you zoom in even further, you find that inside those cells are micro machines, molecules, which are constantly busying around making the cell do the thing it does. And at, right in the center of that is DNA, which is the code for the, for the cellular machinery. And so we live in this sort of multi-scale world we're not aware of all these different scales below us and even above us most of the time, but that is the reality. And the real genius of nature's stuff is that it builds it from very few ingredients, mostly sort of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, uh, nitrogen, and, uh, um, and a few other things. And it's fully recyclable. <laughs> so everything dies, but then it's the building blocks for the next generation of stuff. It's, it's a really remarkable system, but not just that, it does something else. You and I, we have constant systems at, at the subcellular level, at the cellular level, at the tissue level, constantly monitoring whether the system above it and below it is behaving correctly. If it's damaged, there are systems to repair it. So we are constantly self-repairing ourselves. We wouldn't, we wouldn't live a day if we didn't have these systems. And most of life does that. So you've got this breathing self-repairing going up and down the scale. Now, if I look at the other side of the diagram, you have sort of human materials and it's a triumph and it's still full of all these different structures, big buildings and cars and phones. Amazing, the smartphone, isn't it? I mean, that's a real triumph. And it's, if you zoom into it, you get this little wire and you zoom in further, you get these tiny little machines called micro machines. That's, what, no, that's how the phone knows which way up it is. Uh, in, and there's crystals and there's transistors, billions of them all connected, little, little brain, little artificial brain, incredible stuff, nanostructures, and also all the atoms that we've kind of dug out of the earth and worked out what they do and, you know, chemistry in general, incredible. But what we haven't done is do what nature can do. We haven't managed to get each of these scale of structure, which, which builds all this technology. We haven't got them to talk to each other and to repair them. And also what we haven't done is to get them to be a recyclable system. Like we, we utterly failed to do that. <laughs> so these are the things we need to do. And if we do it, then we can make stuff that will heal itself. And then we can start to build cities that are gonna be robust in the future. So I wanna show you a bit of stuff for how we've done it, how we're moving towards this. So asphalt roads, 
Okay, it sounds mundane, boring, but actually, if you don't have roads, you really have very little. <laughs> um, and you really need functioning roads to have civilization and to have the wealth of stuff that you all take for granted, we all take for granted. And if we look at the same scale of a road, you have big stuff, the road, and of course, we have the problem, the, the potholes that start to form. If you zoom in further, you, you'll get the smaller stuff, little cracks, they almost left in the beginning. If you zoom in further, you'll find it's actually a, a combination of a liquid and, and, and stones, aggregate so-called. And, and the liquid is called tar. You zoom in further and that tar has got structure in it. <laughs> and it's actually incredible that you zoom further and further and you find actually little micelles. And these are things that look like cells. And in fact, of course, it's not surprising. This stuff comes from old cells, millions of years old. And it, and it self-assembles again as soon as you put it back together. <laughs> incredible. And so what happens is, there's a whole load of self-repairing machinery down here that is already working in the roads. And in fact, when you put a new road down and small cracks form at the small scale, they heal up. The stuff heals itself. It's an incredible thought. But what happens with the weathering, so hot, cold, hot, cold, water gets in and so on, ice forms, is that you get little cracks forming and they will heal up except after a certain size, and then they just there's a runaway problem, and you get you get these massive potholes, and the whole thing falls apart, and then you have to basically redo the whole road. So we thought, well, what if you could intervene? What if you could make sure that when the little cracks form, they get healed? How can we do that? Well, our first thought was to, to do something maybe a little bit, you know, obvious, which is to get a, a, a 3D printer to print material into the cracks, and. It, it sounds an obvious thing to do. It's not that easy, so we, but we managed to get it to work. And you can get little, little. You can basically we got a, um, to put it on a on a on a road vehicle or on a drone. So the drone flies down, it spots little cracks, and it starts to repair them. And that that works. But and 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 our, and our thought was well for the big stuff we can have drones flying up and down like like flocks of birds, and they just sit with solar power recharging them on lampposts and they fly up and down motorways and roads and when they spot a little crack they just look left and right make sure there's nothing coming zoom down and repair it and that that kind of autonomous system with with robots around a city is is one way to do this problem but but we thought actually there's there's a kind of cleverer way to do it a more high-tech way but probably a better way to do this which is to which is to supercharge the self-healing mechanisms that are already in a road at the micro level and get them to work better. And various people have had a go at this doing this. Um, in, in the Netherlands has been really pushing this approach forward the most, but in the UK, we've also got work doing it. And I'll tell you a bit about it. So what you can do is you can put stuff inside the road. In the case, you can put little, little bits of metal um, or little capsules of oil, and they sit there and they're perfectly fine. And then you get, um, you, 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 all you have to do is pass over it with a vehicle, uh, an electromagnetic charge, and it heats up the little, the, the little bit of metal. And because it heats it up, it gives the local tar some energy, and that little tar flows into the little cracks. So by driving down the road once a month, and this, this, this experiment is ongoing in the Netherlands, <laughs> you can get a road to last much longer. Instead of lasting 10 years, you can get it to last 20 years. With the capsules, what happens is a crack opens up the capsule, it bursts open and there's some more little tar oil in there and that then fills the crack and helps the, the self-healing molecular structures do their job. So you can see that although this is baby steps, this is a way to really make our cities, in this case, the roads, um, look after themselves. And the thing is, if you can stop the cracks forming at the early stages, then you stop the big top potholes forming. And that really is the crucial thing here. Once they're formed, it's really difficult to do anything about it. And of course, big storms come in and fill the water and you're really in trouble. And that's, of course, how we operate, right? <laughs> the reason that we are healthy most of the time is because our body's constantly spotting problems and inter intervening without you constantly ever knowing it, right? You have a whole immune system. And so this immune system idea is what we, we want for cities. And it's gonna be embedded in the material. And what do we call that type of approach? We call it an animate material. And, and this, is, this is a much bigger idea than just 
repairing roads. This is really the future of everything we, we now build in the future. So I um, come back to this sort of comparison between the living world and the non-living world. Uh, or, and, and I think that's going to get blurred. So we, we're going to have more and more things that look after themselves. They're not alive per se, but they're going to have autonomy. They're going to have dynamic um, abilities. They're going to be able to make decisions. Now that sounds an odd thing. How can a material make a decision? But let's just look at this diagram again. If you think living materials, okay, so trees, we, we recognize that they, they have autonomy, right? They obviously grow themselves. They have molecular things inside them that are doing that. Unless you think there's some intrinsically different physics in the living world than the rest of the world, if life itself, this, this, this ability to have living stuff is, is some extra thing, extra bit of science, but we don't believe that. We believe that actually, all the science is there. It's the same science that we build our same materials from. It's just that life has managed to get information to flow up these different scales. And when I say information, I mean little signals. And of course, at the different scales, it's taking in this signal and computing some answer. Now, this is all subconscious, obviously, unless you think trees are conscious. And of course, whales have a certain consciousness and mice have a certain consciousness and and we would like to think our own consciousness is is, is sort of greater than theirs but this may be a we may be fooling ourselves here <laughs> so i think it's, it's it's about being humble really realizing how amazing life is but also taking taking the example of that and saying well look life is robust and has lasted for billions of years because it's constantly repairing itself it's constantly rebuilding itself and it's it, it works from the bottom to the top to do that and what we haven't done in human technology is do that yet we, we've managed to do very amazing things like make mobile phones and smartphones and go to the moon and make huge buildings and glass structures and incredible cars as in <laughs> bmw cars no doubt and the most amazing cars but what we haven't done actually is change the paradigm completely and and you call it, of course, you think, well, okay, life, you know, they ha it has energy, right? Life is constantly getting energy from its environment, but that's also totally possible. In fact, we know we can do that already. They're called solar cells. And that's just one way in which we have energy harvesting materials. But what we haven't done with the solar cells, that they're really dumb, actually. Just put this thing on the outside of a house or a roof. And it just, it just, it basically just gets older and older and gets more damaged. What we don't do and we need to do is make those solar cells use a little bit of the energy they're harvesting from the sun to constantly look at the solar cell array and see where it's damaged and to repair that damage. Then you can have a solar cell roof that will last a hundred years or maybe a thousand years instead of a moment where you'll notice that almost all the renewable technology you putting, putting in now has A, no end of life. No one's really thought how it's going to be recycled in the future. That's a problem for the future generation. And two, it doesn't have a very long life because it's constantly decaying, big storms come, and it has no way of, of repairing itself. So the paradigm shift is renewable technology infrastructure that not only knows its damage, but can repair itself by harvesting energy. So that may sound mad, but it is actually inevitable. I, I don't see a way in which we can go forward and not do this. We, have, we know we can do it, we know it's possible because nature does it. We actually have all the amazing en uh, engineering to be able to engineer at the different scales. What we haven't done is just put two and two together yet. <laughs> so I would say a sustainable city of the future is going to be a self-repairing city. It probably will have many different levels of self-repairing this. I think there is a role for the drones that fly around and, and repair big stuff and, 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 and intervene at a bigger scale. Um, in the same way, there's a role for surgeons in our own health. Occasionally, you get so ill, you have to go to hospital, they have to open you up. So I, I think there's a role for the big stuff, the drones, and, but, I also, but I think mostly what we're going to need to build is self-repairing materials. And th this diagram really shows you where we've come from. Like, when we first started on this planet, <laughs> um, you know, we had, we had rocks and flints, and we, we invented glues and ceramics and metals, and we named the ages of civilization after those materials. But as we move forward, so we've made them more and more sophisticated and our, and our cities and our infrastructure has got more sophisticated. And it looks a bit like this now. 
with nanotechnology and smart materials, but actually self-healing materials, animate materials, this is the future. And our cities may look very, very different then. And that's going to be quite exciting. Thank you for your patience and looking forward to talking to you more about this.